Welcome back to Dark Realm Tales. Today we are going to be watching some of the most devastating interviews of convicted murderers and sex offenders. Be warned, some of these interviews contain very disturbing comments and remarks. Don't forget to like and comment. Get this video to 100 likes and we shall share uncensored, unseen footage that you have never seen before. It didn't really occur to me to shoot an abortionist myself until it was eight days prior to the shooting. I was touching up a car on a, on a used car lot and it hit me that uh, what would happen if I were to shoot an abortionist myself. On July 29, 1994, Paul Jennings Hill approached an abortion clinic in Pensacola. When he spotted Dr. John Britton and his bodyguard, retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel James H. Barrett outside the clinic, he fired on both of them at close range with a Mossberg Model 500A 12-gauge pump-action shotgun. Both Britton and Barrett died. Barrett's wife, June, was also wounded. Following the shots, Hill laid his shotgun on the ground and waited to be arrested. Hill was sentenced to death by lethal injection and was executed on September 3, 2003. It was a difficult morning. I had stayed up late the previous night preparing virtually my every move so I could just force myself to go through them. I thought I was gonna be full of righteous zeal to carry out the, the shooting, but I wasn't. My, my, my stomach felt like a bottomless pit, you know, and, and I, uh, uh, the, norm, the normal zest and zeal I have in life was just missing. It, it, was, it was very difficult. Um, I'm smiling now about it, but I wasn't smiling then. It was a very grim task. They pulled in past me and uh, parked, and I took about 10 steps to where I had laid my shotgun and pulled it out, and um, there was a wooden fence that at that point it scared me from their view, and so I took a quick peek around the, the side of the fence to see where they were, and I, so then I stepped out from behind the, the fence and raised the shotgun and, and, read, and fired three times. So, um, the first three shots were almost directly at, they were directly at the driver, and I think he absorbed most of the shot. And then I ran to a tree, and I knelt behind the tree as I had planned and reloaded three rounds in my shotgun, and then raised the gun again. And at that time, the abortionist was rocking his head back and forth. I think he was trying to avoid having his head shot. And as a matter of fact, he succeeded, because my first shot missed, and I lowered my aim, the second shot hit his body, his body reacted very violently. And then I followed that with uh, three more subsequent shots, and he stopped moving. And also no question that I hope others will act in ways similar to the way I acted. So yeah, I hope to uh, encourage others to, to defend the unborn much as I did. Defendant Paul Jennings Hill is hereby sentenced in count one the death of the murder of Dr. John Baynard Foote is hereby sentenced in count. Two. When the prosecution first announced they were going to be seeking the death penalty, the, the heightened threat definitely served to increase my joy. <laughs> it really did. Uh, and and uh, because the prospect of possibly dying for having obeyed Jesus Christ and defended innocent children um, is, was a wonderful prospect. It continue, continues to be. Actually, I didn't really decide to do it until Monday, prior to my shooting abortions on Friday. And uh, it was a very emotional experience because I was thinking in my mind whether I was going to shoot this abortionist or not. And yet, I kind of felt like I probably would. And um, we went to Pensacola Beach and got a relatively secluded section of the beach there. And I had three children, a three-year-old, a six-year-old, and a nine-year-old. And um, there was one a uh, portion of our time there at the beach where it was very uh, emotional for me because I realized I would never be going to the beach like this again with my children. And it was, uh, you, um, literally all my paternal instincts were stirred there as I was playing with my children and 
and watching them and watching my wife, you know, and walk along the beach. And uh, I took each one of the children one by one out into the surf, you know, over their heads. And I was supporting each one and holding them in, in the water. And um, it occurred to me that I was making a sacrifice. You know, it was um, thinking about the promise made to Abraham that if he was willing to sacrifice his son, that God would grant him descendants as numerous as the sands of the of, on the seashore and the stars in the sky. And um, you know, I just laid hold on that promise. You know, and and uh, um, you know, there there was a a real um, the emotions were so powerful. You know, it was difficult to keep tears from coming to my eyes. And I just, uh, you know, just lifted my heart up and prayed. Psychopathic offenders may be rapists, child molesters, sadists, or any type of sex offender. They may not even be sex offenders, but engage in other forms of criminal or exploitive behavior instead. The hallmark of psychopathy is that the person doesn't have a problem in one area, such as sex, but has a pervasive lack of responsibility, as well as a lack of attachment to other people. In this next interview, Robert describes behavior which puts him in the category of power and controlled rapist, but doesn't necessarily tell us his problems are pervasive and that he has no capacity for attachment. That will come later. Yeah, it was power and control. I was grooming her from the age of, it started about the age of one. Uh, when I was the punisher, I was the, I was the one who decided punishment over the children. I was the one who spanked the children. I was the one who, who punished the children. And, and if I seen the children doing anything wrong, even bickering and arguing amongst themselves, I would whip them and tell them, you know, just, just kids playing. I would, I, I would tell myself, well, she's not going to be like that. She is going to be the perfect mate. And I told myself that. And I didn't molest her then. The perfect mate. The perfect so were... mate. I was grooming her to fit me. Mm -hmm. To fit me. And what, at what age? I started at about a year, I started grooming her, whooping her, and telling her this, to do this, not do that. Then when I molested her at 18 months old. And I thought to myself, I said, well, this is, this is going to be easy. This is going to be easy. I'm going to have my own child, my own stepdaughter which is really not blood related to me. And I'm telling myself these things, it's not blood related to me. When she grows up to be 14, 15 years old, I will have the perfect sexual mate for sexual purposes. Anything else didn't matter. It was sex, that was it. I didn't care about, really, honestly, I didn't love the child. I wanted the child for my own purposes. I was, I was the one potty training her, okay? Uh, my wife let me potty train her. I potty trained her. And at the, first, at, at the first when I was potty training her, I gave her a break. Every now and then she could use the bathroom in her pants. But I was setting her on that stool for sometimes hours at a time, telling her to use the bathroom there. She got started doing it. She started using the potty, and then all of a sudden she would, I've been doing this for about three, four months, and she got good at it, and then all of a sudden she would use the bathroom in her pants, and I would tear her hide up. I would actually put bruises on her butt by spanking her by using the, bath, using the bathroom in her pants. How'd you get a little kid to sit on the potty for hours? That's an awful long time. Yell and scream. Tell her, you gonna use that potty? And you ain't gonna get off that potty till you use that potty. Have you used the potty yet? No. You're gonna sit there until you use it. And and and, I, and as I look back, I was done that way, the same way she was done. How was you justified in your head? How I justified in my head? She's gonna do what I wanted to do, and that's it. She's gonna use the bathroom. She's going to, uh, let's say. 
I told her that Daddy loves her, and Daddy's going to take care of her, and Daddy's going to give her anything she wants as long as she does what Daddy tells her. I got married at 19, and I kind of like refrained, refrained from or tried to refrain from sexually acting out with any other ladies besides her because I knew that AIDS was coming out and I knew that diseases were very frequent and I started thinking to myself that uh, if I stick with this one girl and just groom her for one woman I would groom her and get her to do what I wanted her to do and eventually she did she done what I asked her to do it was no problem it was it was a little at a time and I done it and I manipulated her and coerced her Manipulation, coercion, violent behaviors, striking her, uh, 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 get her, get her so drunk she'd pass out, and I'd do what I want to with her. I'd force myself upon her when she was passed out, and did what I pleased. Uh, and my sexual behavior got real, real out of out of whack. Yeah, I made her force objects into her vagina. I uh, made her, uh, forced her into uh, watching pornographic material and stating that I wanted to do that certain thing to her. Uh, I wanted to, I wanted to have sex with her uh, constantly. This was a, every day. Every day, three or four times, I would get it, want it as many times in the day as I could get it. And I have got it up to six times in one day. And still, still, I did not have enough. I wanted more. It was like a fix. I wanted it. And I did every, anything I could to get it. And how many victims did you have total? I have a total of, uh, of 24 now. And I am looking to see if I have any more. And were these, you said these were all kids except two? Right? No. Oh, yeah, well, they were under the age of 18. Most of my victims were the age of 11 to 16. And how did you get control of them? Was it through force and control and violence? It was manipulate. No, it wasn't violence. It was, it was more like manipulation. It was coercion. It was like, uh, uh, I'll buy you this. I'll give you that. You know, and treating them like a person, but they were just objects. They were just objects. I was doing anything in my power to get them to give sex up, to give it up. And that's what I used to tell them. I said, give it up, you know. After I would have done, say, groomed them up, and then I would and they would comply. I would use, I would buy them beer, get them drunk, get them high, get them, uh, uh, any way that I could manipulate a woman or a girl, I mean a, a child, into having sex, I would do it. Here Robert shows lack of attachment to anybody, which suggests that he is not only a power and controlling sex offender, he is also quite psychopathic. The best way to fool people is to help them is to uh, ask what they want, ask what they need. Do they need any help doing anything? Do they, do, uh, uh, do they need any money? Or do they need their car fixed? Do they need the grass cut? Do they need uh, their children looked out for? Do they need uh, uh, a job? Do they need uh, anything, anything to get them to think that I am a decent person and want to help? Trust me. I will help. And overall, that, that, that was a flat out lie. Why do you think it makes people so trusting? Oh, what do you mean, as far as trusting? Trusting you. Trusting me? Because I think, uh, to trust me, uh, I thought that, that I could be trusted to a certain extent. And, and, but, behind their on the, behind their back no 
I would take things from them, steal from them, scope out things that I could steal, uh, uh, just see what I could get out of somebody, uh, just get what I wanted. That's what I wanted. I, I see something I want to get somebody to trust me. Like, say, if I was to go over and cut this person's grass, uh, fix his car, loan him some money, and then he, and, and if I see something I want, like he's got a nice stereo, then, and I would set it up. I would say, hey, well, he's not home at such and such a time. Uh, that'd be the perfect time to go get me a stereo. So I would say, hey, he's gone. I know exactly how to get in through the back way. I'll even go into his house and open a window so I can come in here tomorrow and steal his stereo. I was looking out for number one, for me. I didn't have any empathy for anybody else because it seemed to me nobody had any empathy for me. I wasn't going to give anybody any empathy that didn't give it to me. And that was it. That was the bottom line. You, you don't, and, uh, I didn't have people cry for me or, or, or tell me, ask me if I needed anything. Uh, then, you know, I wouldn't use any empathy. I would fake it. Now, fake empathy, like saying, I know how you feel. I've been in that situation before. I've done that, and it didn't turn out all that hot. And, and I would fake it, but there wasn't no empathy there. That was just a show. That was just a tell. That was just to get the person to say, well, hey, you know, he it seemed like he's pretty, pretty good fellow. And... Yeah, that, that was manipulation all the way. I am what a child molester looks like. I am what a serial killer looks like. I don't know if I have any feelings. Maybe, maybe that's my birth defect. I wasn't ever, I wasn't even born with feelings. I don't know. Because I've never felt anything about anything. Richland, Washington, halfway between Seattle and Idaho on the Columbia River, is one of those towns people refer to as a good place to grow up in. An ordinary town. But people here, like people in other peaceful places, have learned to listen for sounds other than childish laughter, learned to fear their parks and playgrounds and parking lots and homes. Because something happened in Richland that happens in many good places to grow up in. A monster grew up here. In September 1989, two young boys disappeared, riding their bikes in a Vancouver, Washington park. They were found later in the day, stabbed to death. Justin last saw his little brother. The following here month, a four-year-old boy disappeared from a nearby playground. Came right to this spot. His body was found three days later beside a Vancouver lake. Two weeks after that, a child began screaming in this movie theater. A man was trying to kidnap him. The man was arrested. He was 28-year-old Wesley Dodd of Richland. He confessed to murdering the three children. He said he had hoped to kill many more. The most startling thing about Wesley Dodd is how ordinary he seems. Small and harmless looking. The handcuffs seem unnecessary. He speaks in a matter-of-fact voice about unspeakable things. You must have discovered something about yourself in the last two years that you've been in here. What is it? What should people know about you? I don't know. I can't really say I really discovered much about myself. Uh, I think really the, the biggest thing is that everything could have been prevented. Uh, I mean, I've, I've got an, 
I've had so many contacts with police and confessed to so many crimes and never been charged or charges was dropped. I was never prosecuted for one reason or other. I first started exposing myself when I was 13 years old. My first contact with police came when I was 15. On uh, March 10th of 1977, I was arrested by the Richland Police Department here in Washington. Uh, I confessed to six or seven different crimes. I couldn't remember for sure. So these seven cases probably involved close to 20 kids. For 30 minutes, Dodd described molesting children they, they from one end of the state to another, getting caught, confessing, yeah. and walking away a free man. He said he should have been in prison in four different places at the time he was killing the three little boys. The story was absurd, blaming his murders on those who failed to stop him. And it was hard to believe that so many authorities had let him get away. They suggested that I get counseling, but didn't think anything was serious enough to press charges. And that was it, it was dropped. But we retraced his 15-year trail of abused kids and discovered that he was telling the truth. In his early 20s, Dodd had moved to Lewiston, Idaho, just across the border from Washington. He molested a little boy there several times on both sides of the state line. He confessed to it in both states. Idaho sentenced me to 10 years in prison, but the sentence was commuted to one year in a county jail, and I served only four months of that. So I did four months of a 10-year sentence. Um, everybody over there, is pointing fingers at each other. The judge is saying, well, he made such a good impression. I, I can recall he made a good appearance in court. Uh, he was a kind of a humble kid, and he appeared to be a reasonably bright kid. Judge John Maynard is retired now. He is haunted by the Wesley Dodd case. He says he can't understand how it happened, how he let such a man go. Did you know that he was a repeated offender? No. That was not in his pre-sentence information. Why? I have no idea. Nothing in there to indicate that he had a real serious problem. How could they have missed Dodd's problem? He had been caught all around the state of Washington molesting kids. The Navy had even found out about him and discharged him. Now, can I get the criminal record of Wesley Dodd? But Judge Maynard was right, partly. Only a fraction of Dodd's record was reported to him before the sentencing. Even so, that report is full of warnings that something was seriously wrong with Wesley Dodd. A sex crime against another child two years earlier. The arrest for indecent liberties in the neighboring town. Counseling for molesting a boy seven years earlier in Richland. Unsuccessful counseling because Dodd failed to show up for his appointments. One of Dodd's therapists worked just a block away from the courthouse. I had a, a gut feeling. I thought this person was capable of escalating his behaviors. But Psychologist no Steve Lindsley had treated Dodd for an earlier sex crime and dropped him for non-attendance. Now he was appointed to treat him again. Dodd says Lindsley realized how dangerous he was, but still no one did anything to stop him. He says you predicted he might commit murder. In treatment, I did mention to him that I felt that he was capable of doing those kind of things with the idea that he needed to take these things serious. Dodd should have been arrested again the moment he was released from the Idaho jail. Arrested and taken to this courthouse on the Washington side of the state line. Rise, please. Judge John Lydon was the county prosecutor then. Court is in session. You may be seated. A memo from his staff alerted him that Dodd should be picked up and prosecuted for molesting the boy in Washington. Lydon admits he should have done that, but he didn't. He says he doesn't know why. He says the case just got lost in the shuffle. Free again, Dodd headed west for Seattle. Moved to Seattle on June 13, 1987. I tried to kidnap a boy. My intentions at that point were to kidnap him, 
to rape him and to kill him so that he couldn't report me. I was, this boy knew what to do. He knew something was wrong, he wouldn't go with me and, and he made an excuse to leave the area and he went home. He was able to identify me and I was arrested that night. Well, I wrote one night, filed the case on this guy, locked this guy up forever. Rebecca Rowe, head of a special team that prosecutes sex crimes in Seattle, has bitter memories of Wesley Dodd. What happened to him here? Why do you only get 118 days? Um, essentially a interpretation, in my view, a hyper-technical interpretation of the statute by a judge who made a finding on a reduced charge. It was never, um, you know, it was never negotiated or plea bargained. We filed attempted kidnap one on him, which was the top charge we could file, and made a recommendation of a lot of time in prison, and a judge made a decision that was the judge's decision. You saw him as dangerous. From day one. You only had to read his confession to know, you know, he confessed in our case, and he said what he was what his intent was, and he outlined the length of time that he had had this, uh, you know, this problem. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think it took a rocket scientist to figure out he was dangerous. Um, was found guilty of attempted unlawful detainment. I had already been in jail. By the time I got to sentencing for that, I'd already been in jail for 118 days, which is beyond what they normally give for that kind of a crime. So I was released. And I remember just being sick when our judge, who it's, you know, I'm just, is a good, thoughtful judge who was making a legal decision that I'm sure he felt, you know, he had to make. I didn't agree with it. I don't always agree with judges, but it just made me sick. The judge, Stephen Riley, has retired. He declined comment. After that, Dodd says, his sexual fantasies and his plans merged. He would murder his victims to avoid arrest, and the prospect of murder became exciting. And I, I just became completely obsessed with it. That's all I thought about 24 hours a day. I, mean, I was dreaming about it at night, uh, constantly all day at work. That's all I thought about was killing kids. some standard police photos of crime scenes. The lakeside where one body was found. The park where Dodd found two boys, molested one, and stabbed both to death. His home where he killed a four-year-old boy. The theater where he tried to grab another victim and was caught. And there are diaries, meticulous handwritten notes and diagrams as Dodd planned and carried out the murders. He wrote of a wounded child pleading, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, before Dodd stabbed him again. Another entry says, I think I got more of a high out of killing than molesting. And I must find another child. his briefcase with the next child's underpants. And finally, a little photo album Dodd kept of that killing, the four-year-old named Lee, kidnapped from a park and taken to Dodd's home. You kept a photo album, why? Two reasons, really. One was to help me remember what I'd done, exactly what had happened, what he looked like, uh, for my own, you know, pleasure. And we'll get photos later on. And another one was so the next time I got a boy home, 
I could show him pictures of Lee hanging in the closet, and then I'd kill that boy. We are aware how disturbing this video is. We made it because we have seen children report acts of sadistic abuse and not be believed, because the listener refuses to accept that such things happen. It is easier to deny malevolence than to face it. We have no hope of detecting or stopping this kind of behavior if we don't learn something about it. Let's hope that the next victim will not need to report several times before they are finally believed. Or better yet, that there will never be a next victim. Thanks for watching, and watch this next video.